and welcome everyone. Hi, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Very happy to welcome you to the 21st lecture of the logical reasoning in human genetics. Uh, today, the topic is on the importance of checking data and results in genomics. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Simon Heath from the Centro Nacional de Análisis Genómico of Barcelona in Spain. He leads the bioinformatics development and statistical genomics team at that uh, center. And he's also the manager of the functional genomics unit um, of the same center. Uh, the conversation today will be led and moderated by Professor Joseph Terwilliger from Columbia University, professor of neurobiology, um, and uh, who was one of the founders of the Logical Reasoning in Human Genetics uh, series, along with a few other people who are attending today, such as uh, Professor Sonia Abdelhaq from Institut Pasteur, or uh, Professor um, Aisha Nasser from the University of uh, Tripoli. And uh, now, I, Joe, the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone, again. Um, hi, and um, welcome everyone back to our uh, series on logical reasoning and human genetics. Um, I'm glad to introduce Simon Heath. He's been a person that I've taught courses with over the last quarter century or so. Um, <laughs> and um, he's going to speak today. So I, I personally, as a professor, I always tell people that, you know, the way you learn, the way you direct students is by, you know, first of all, not being afraid to make mistakes and then showing what happens when you make mistakes and then by actually making mistakes. That's my excuse, at least, for making as many mistakes as I make, um, which is a lot, as I'm sure Simon will tell you. Um, um, but the thing is that today what Simon's going to do is go through basically all the things that he knows how to screw up from experience over the years, and hopefully that can be used as a learning tool. So I, I think you're going to really enjoy the lecture, and I'd like to turn it over now to Simon, and um, go for it. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, let's see whether this time I can actually make the uh, make the, the screen display work properly. So it says... no, let's try that one again. Again, to illustrate what happens when we make mistakes and we learn from <laughs> I'm guessing that one didn't work either. Yes, we have it. You have it. Good. Yes. That okay. says L, L, yeah. LGHR Lecture 21. Perfect. Yep. yep. Okay. So as Joe, Joe was saying that um, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, some of our my and my uh, experience over the last uh, 25, 30 years of uh, doing genomic analysis of various types and the uh, many ways that things could go wrong. And hopefully by some of the examples I will be showing, this will um, help you avoid some of these and also give some ideas about what to look out for. So I'd like to start with uh, this idealized way that that we think we might that people do science, that you have a, a question, a scientific question, a hypothesis, a, an idea that that uh, some that factor A controls a particular disease, or maybe you, you're more trying to find out what is happening. Um, can you find genetic factors? You have hypothesized genetic factors uh, uh, which are varying in your population, which affect a particular disease. So you then come up with a study design after hearing the, uh, the great lectures uh, You've, you've had in this course. Then there's uh, an aspect of data collection where we have to collect samples and actually collect the biological material that we'll be studying um, and then generate the data we're looking at. And then we have statistical analysis, writing, this produces papers and you get great success with these, allows you to repeat the cycle because that way you can get more money, you can do more and more studies. Of course, in reality, things are slightly more complicated um, and these tend to form various feedback loops so that uh, when you start doing the analyses, you realize you should have had more data. So you have to go back and collect more data or maybe the results of analysis. show your original hypothesis was wrong and you end up with a new scientific question or while you're going through the writing phase and the review cycles, you might be told or informed it's better way 
better ways of doing the analysis, better ways of doing the study, and things, things will change. But even this is not as complicated as things are really, and in fact, things are much more uh, messy. Um, a typical uh, scientific study will involve uh, not yourself, it involves finding collaborators to work with, people who can help you both on the logistics of running the, the, the program, of running the study, and also the uh, having access to, to uh, having access to different to 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 samples, uh, um, funding opportunities as well. We have to be able to go and uh, be able to have enough money to run the, to run these. So the whole whole part of the of the study, which is actually becomes more administration than science, and then at the bottom, the data collection, analyses, and writing. There's also, two two other parts which are, I'll be talking about more today, which are the quality control of the uh, of all aspects of the of the data collection, and then a, ch a checking phase where we do sanity checking on the results to see whether these make sense. And to tell you the truth, in most things I've been working on, these two aspects as quality control and results checking are far more time consuming and more far more important than actually almost everything else. Um, so this is a uh, particularly more than the the statistical analysis, which often is just a question of getting the results into the right format and pushing a button. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today are these two aspects: the quality control aspect, and then this aspect of of checking the results. So quality control is actually vast because it affects all stages of of how the data are actually produced um, and analyzed. So initially we have the, the collection of data, the finding, finding of the samples we're working with, um, extraction of the biological material. This might require uh, dissection of a particular tissue or separation of a particular cell type from your, from your sample. These then have to be stored and prepared in the right way, uh, transported to where they'll be processed. Um, all of this while keeping them in a good state so that the, the material we're using, typically DNA or RNA, is, 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 uh, is kept um, in a non-degraded state. We also have to collect metadata about the samples, um, such as their phenotypes, their disease status, um, information such as their, their age, their sex, uh, all, all that sort of information. And that has to be uh, collected and associated with the correct samples. Once you have this, um, there's the data generation phase, where there's, again, a whole series of checks which have to be made to make sure that the biological samples you get are in a good state. Um, and the preparation of the sample for sequencing is worked correctly, that the sequencing itself is works, works correctly, um, and that the data that comes out is, is, uh, is, is, in a, is of good quality. We then have a primary data analysis phase, which is where we take the, the raw sequencing data and produce sequence variants, or if you're looking for expression, you might be looking at transcript abundance. Um, and then a secondary data analysis, which is more the what people think of when we talk about doing statistical analyses for genomic studies. And this is where we're trying to associate um, genomic variants or variation in, in, in a in our expression or variation in epigenetic factors with particular phenotypes. And then lastly becomes the interpretation. Each of these, each of these steps has quality control measures associated with it. Each stage depends on the previous one. And each stage depends on the quality control of the previous one being done correctly. So let's take as an example a study which we see a lot of uh, in our center, which is looking at differential gene expression using next generation sequencing. So this would be RNA RNA seq typically. Um, if you look at all the all the stages involved in the project, we have identification of of, of the patients or controls we're working with. We have the collection of the biological material, and since we're looking here for expression, we have to make sure we get the right tissue type, the right cell type. The material has to be prepared and stored and transported in the correct way to the sequencing center. In the center, they will look to make sure that the, there's, uh, the starting material is of the appropriate quality and quantity. They generate sequencing libraries, which are the actual um, material which you, which you put onto the sequences to, to generate the sequence data. The sequencing itself 
um, normally have an, a, a first stage which generates some some raw results, which then have to be interpreted to produce the actual sequence read itself, and that's called the base calling. Um, then the sequence reads are mapped onto the transcriptome, and this allows us to get estimates of the transcript abundance. And once you have that, you can then do this differential expression analysis, seeing whether between cases and controls, for example, you have different levels of expression in particular genes, and then you have to interpret the results. So there's a whole series of different stages involving different processes um, and different po possible ways that these can go wrong. Now, in an ideal world, when you're sitting down to do the looking at doing this final CISCAN analysis, you will have actually been involved in all of these steps so that you have a good appreciation of how the data have arrived at you uh, on your desk, what are all the stages that have gone through. This is not often possible, and in many cases, you might have only been involved in the project when the data are already there, and the what you get on your desk is, is, a, is a file containing these uh, um, the phenotype data and the uh, file containing the, the, the expression results. Um, but it, I always, I think it's very important that you should be, you should have a knowledge of this entire process. You should know where the data that you're looking at, where they came from and what stages they went through so that you can be aware of the reliability of each aspect of that process, where things could have gone wrong. Um, you should be aware of how much data errors at different stages during the process could affect the analysis uh, so that if there's been a mistake made with the storing of the data of, of the biological sample when it's first detected, when it's first uh, first extracted from the, from the patient, that could actually have a knock-on effect all the way down, meaning that the results are poor for, for that for that sample. Um, sometimes these different steps will produce a single clear result. So, for example, the the base calling. Um, Sequences might say this is clearly the sequence has a, you know, a C T T G, uh, but sometimes you can get statements of uncertainty which are which come from a previous round, and that's those where they're available and where it's appropriate should often be used. And it, it's quite common in my experience that people, if they think about errors at all, might focus on one or a few possible sources of the, of errors, without considering the entire process, without considering everything that could have gone wrong. And that can be very dangerous. And I hope I can show you show you this and persuade you of this by some of the examples. So again, continuing with the idea of the RNA-seq um, for differential expression, we could have lots of things could have gone wrong. We could have misclassification of the sample phenotype, so your case control statuses are not correct. You could have a contamination in the tissue isolation, so you think you're you're looking at at lung, but in fact you look you actually it's contaminated with with uh, with uh, immune immune cells, for example. Um, you can have a, a mess up where the, the the samples get switched at some point in the in the in the procedure, um, or some other informatics issues where the data associated with the sample gets corrupted. Now, sample switching can actually happen quite quite easily in many ways, and in fact, it's amazing it doesn't happen more often. If you think that in many high throughputs um, and uh, uh, projects, it's not a single sample that's been looked at at once. It'd be blocks of samples of, of, of 32, 48, or 96, which are handled at the same time in, in plates with large you know, multi, multi pipettes. And it can and does happen where, that you can have um, plates which are, which have become turned or, or inverted and the, the sequence of samples is not the same as, as has been written down in the, uh, in, the, in the appropriate spreadsheets, and then everything goes wrong. Now, well-run centers, there's checks and balances to make to, to prevent this from happening, but it can happen, and you, it's something you have to be aware of. You can also get sample damage during storage or transport because the samples weren't originally prepared correctly, or maybe they got stuck in customs uh, over a long weekend, and by the time they were picked up, um, there was no more dry ice, and everything got too hot, and everything's degraded. You can get a problems during the preparation of the sequence libraries. We recently here had a, had a problem that one of our key machines used to, um, to actually fragment the DNA uh, started misbehaving and um, started destroying select 
subsets of, of, of DNA fragments, which biased all the results coming through until, until, we, until we pick this up. So things, can, things like that can happen. We have problems during sequencing itself due to problems with reagents, problems with uh, power cuts, problems with uh, mistakes made in the launch of the program. Lastly, we can, we can have problems in the bioinformatics analysis uh, where somebody's used uh, the wrong annotation, the wrong reference, they've used the wrong program that's not appropriate for the particular data we, we're dealing with. And lastly, we can have a problem that the actual differential expression analysis itself has been, has been run incorrectly. There's lots of places things can go wrong. In fact, it's amazing the more you think about it that anything ever comes out which, which, is, which is correct. So that's why it's important to be very skeptical of the results you, you get and to do some sanity, basic sanity checking of any results you have from these types of analysis. And maybe the most important, important thing to have, a concept to have, is to know what you're expecting. In genomic studies, you're typically conducting thousands or millions of tests. And in most scenarios, for most types of analyses, Almost all, if not all of these, should be negative in terms of the test results. You're, you're looking for an association between a genomic variance and a disease. You don't expect to see half the genome lighting up as being significantly associated with your disease. If you do, something's gone wrong. Ideally, it'd be good if you can have positive and negative controls. You have, you have certain observations which you definitely should be seeing, and those you can check. There's some observations which you shouldn't be seeing, and those, again, you can check. And it, these are not always possible, but this is always very nice if, if this can be arranged. Um, another important aspect is how we, what weight we put on p-values. Um, this is a common observation that uh, many people can can actually tend, tend to put too much uh, weight on, onto the actual values of what we get out of the significance test. Um, <clears throat> if you get a p-value of 10 to the minus 65, they say, well, this is amazing. This is so significant. This is definitely true. Um, whereas actually the truth is, if you have a p-value of 10 to the minus 65, it means you've probably definitely done something wrong. P-values are conditional, of course, on all the assumptions you're, you, you're making in your model being true. And this is never the case when you're working with real data. Um, if everything, if you've done everything correctly, and if you've uh, been very careful and you've got the required sample size and you and you've and you've cleaned all your data correctly, the best you can hope for is that the what you have is is an approximation of the truth. The p value is an approximation of 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 what you would if you could actually really assess the significance of your of, of your data. Um, but once you start moving into extreme p-values once you're moving right into the tail of the distribution you're almost definitely getting the wrong answer out here so the p-value itself is not that important what the p-value is is there for is to help you making a decision it's not telling you what's right or wrong it's telling you how to make a decision it's telling you is it worth me carrying on with this, with this experiment carrying on with this hypothesis is it worth now doing extra experiments and not just you, is it worth your collaborators? Is it worth um, the, the, the wider community in taking this as being, taking your observations and then building on them? So what we want to aim for is to have a high chance that when we see something significant, that if somebody tries to repeat it, it will actually be, they, they will, will be able to repeat it and, and uh, in a different sample. So the way I like to work with results when I look at them, is to start off being very, very skeptical about any findings which are a priori significant. And you should work through a process of trying to eliminate all of your significant results. You go with this idea that this is probably wrong. You try your hardest thing you can do to think of and try to test and try to find out some what, what went wrong that gave you this answer. And only at the end of that do you then tell somebody else and get them to do the same thing. And that after that, if you can't, if none, nobody can find out a way where you think you've gone wrong, then you can think about writing this up. Um, 
So, for example, you, you find that you, you, you do a uh, differential expression analysis, you get a significant result, and you think, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. Let's look, go back to the previous stage of uh, looking at the expression results themselves. I look in the two groups, I look at the average and say, ah, do I see that there's a difference? Does, does that make sense? Um, if, if so, let's see if we go further back, you know, check as far back as possible to make sure that everything does seem to make sense. You then, of course, should look in your replicates because um, you won't be doing this if you don't have replica, if you don't have a replica data set, and see whether you you can see the same effect there. Maybe don't stick with the same method if you know there's another method, which statistical method for the analysis, which people say is less powerful, but it should give you a similar answer. Well, you try it and make sure that the answer you're getting is similar, even if it's slightly less significant. And above all, look for any alternate interpretation. So you should really not be trying to convince yourself that this is right. You should be working as a very critical reviewer when you're looking at a paper, trying to trying to find out what's wrong. So I think that's that's it's a very important mindset to be in. Is to, is that what you're trying to do is is really trying to find out what possibly could be wrong, giving you these results. And the reason for this is simple, because once you've told somebody else that you have a significant result, it's very difficult to pull it back. If you tell your collaborator, you tell your boss, you found this difficult result, they'll get very excited. They'll start imagining what else they can do from it. And afterwards, they'll never let you forget once you've said, oh, no, this is all my mistake. I, I, I messed up the analysis. Um, even worse, if uh, you don't realize till later and it gets published, and then you have to do a retraction. And that all that does, it reflects badly on you, but it's also a waste of your time and a waste of ev everyone's time who reads that who reads your article. So it's very important to make sure that what you what what you write about is reliable as possible. So for the second half of the of, 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 of my talk, I, I'm going to focus more on, on some case studies. And most of these studies are actually uh, based on genome-wide association studies, um, mainly because uh, not that these are these are, are particularly error prone. It's it's just that uh, there's a lot of them. There's quite a nice examples showing how things can go wrong, but also many of the um, uh, many of the, the ways the GWAS can go wrong also apply to many other types of genomic studies. And if anything, I'd have to say that the GWAS studies are probably less error prone than many large genomic studies using sequence data, just because the basic data generation is actually more uh, reliable for GWAS than it is for sequencing studies. So what I'm considering here are data generation using microarrays, um, where we can be looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of, of SNPs across the genome. And these are inherently high accuracy. We have very high, highly accurate uh, genotype calls for the vast majority of the SNPs which are covered in the assay. So a typical analysis would be a case control association. We have a bunch of cases, we have a bunch of controls, and we're looking basically for a difference in allele frequency between the two groups. So by its nature, we're doing hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of tests because we're testing each of these uh, each of these uh, SNPs for association. And these types of analyses are highly susceptible to errors due to sample switches because you can't tell if somebody has if a batch of cases is mislabeled as controls. You have no way pure way of knowing that. They also um, can be affected by low quality SNPs or samples, and I will explain a bit more about that coming up. Um, heterogeneity in the population. So this is fairly well known. If, you, if you're actually looking at an association study, but you have a mixture of different populations in there, this can give you false associations. Um, but also, it can also be affected by heterogeneity in the way that the data are generated. It's quite common that a large study may not be um, all, all the data may not be generated at the same time and in the same place, and maybe not on the same platform. So you have, you might have uh, uh, blocks of data which have been generated uh, in, in a different area with uh, using with uh, different personnel, using different methods. And this again can, can introduce the same effect as a population stratification. It can bring about false associations. And I've got 
couple of nice examples of this. And the last one, of course, is phenotype misclassification. And this is uh, this is a problem for all types of uh, of genetic and genomic analyses. If you can't, if your phenotypes are not correctly attributed, then all bets are off, and uh, your results will be unreliable. So, in terms of important quality control points for for GWAS, as I said, the overall accuracy is very high, but certain SNPs or certain samples may have relatively high um, error rates. And a very simple but very powerful assessment of the quality of either of the SNPs or of the samples is a percentage of base calls which pass the quality threshold. And this is called the success, success rate or the call rate. SNPs or samples with low success rates are fundamentally unreliable. None of the data can be trusted and they should be filtered out for analysis. And I hope I can sh show you examples just to show why, or convince you of this. Um, Low frequency SNPs, so ones, so what are like very extreme, um, with a very extreme, very low frequency, can be unreliable when you are dealing with small sample sizes. And this is just basic, basic common sense, is that uh, you end, if it's a very rare SNP and you have a small sample size, you have very few samples with the rare alleles, which means you have a high sensitivity to data errors. So if you have a data error, you know, somebody who's carrying one of these rare alleles, it can, it can, it can suddenly make it look like you have an association. We should also um, do some basic checking for the distribution of, of genotype frequencies for SNPs. For example, the Heide-Weinberg test, which is a very simple test, but very powerful. It's a very good way to check whether there's a systematic errors in your data generation. Um, and as with all association studies, GBOS are susceptible to false associations due to unobserved factors. And that's just something you always have to bear in mind. So I'd like to start with this one. This is um, the results of a GWAS, which actually, as far as we know, as far as I know, this, this was actually not an error. Um, this is a, a, a plot. What is nowadays would be a Manhattan plot. Um, so this is, this is showing um, we're well, actually, as, as, uh, yeah, this is all, all, all the chromosomes across the genome. All the po points we tested, which is 300,000 uh, in this in, uh, for this study. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the negative log 10 of the p-value. Um, so with this many SNPs, we're looking for a uh, genome-wide significance somewhere around 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7. And in fact, you can see clearly we have three peaks um, which exceed that threshold very easily. Um, and the thresh the, the actual noise threshold or the where we're seeing all the other SNPs in the genome, they give P values which tend to be less than 10 to the minus five. So there's a there's a big difference between the apparently significant peaks and everything else. Um, I said this is like the first GWAS we did, probably in about 2015. Um Sorry, 2005, 2005. And what we, this was actually, uh, uh, these are actually, as far as we know, um, correct results. Uh, two of these corresponded to a known linkage peak and have later been shown, and and, and the third one as well. They, 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 they correspond to known genes for this particular trait, which I don't want to go into. Um, what was actually very interesting about this particular study is that this was actually only done with 92 samples um, and we ended up with this with this result and it's just because in fact uh, we, were, we were looking at extremes of the population we had about 3,000 samples and we tested the uh, 45 46 from one end 46 from the other end of the distribution and the effect is absolutely massive um, so it's, it's actually more or less a Mendelian trait which which we're looking at with an association study and we get this uh, very very strong signals but I like to put this up because it, a, it shows you a little bit about what a very nice, clean GWAS should look like. And also, if we home in on those three peaks, we can see that we don't get a single isolated SNP, which is uh, giving you a signal, but instead you, you see a cluster of SNPs nearby, which is, which is what you'd also expect to see in most cases, particularly with more common variants. Um, I don't have a, 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 a slide to show this, but I was around the same time, we also had one which gave us a highly significant result, which was totally wrong. And in this case, 
uh, we could see on, I think it was chromosome one, um, we had um, pretty much nothing along the chromosome, and then suddenly two SNPs next to each other, which had extremely significant p-values, like 10 to the minus 25 or 10 to the minus 30. Um, so this initially looked interesting, but when we looked in more detail, we could see that the SNPs were completely out of Heidi Weinberg. And in fact, when we looked, when we did some digging and some colleagues also did some digging of this, we could see that these uh, SNPs weren't actually on the chromosome one at all. They'd be misattributed. And in fact, they were located on the Y chromosome. And it so happened that we had, no, sorry, on the X chromosome. And it so happened that we had, um, the case of controls was uh, had an uneven distribution of uh, males and females, and all that this was just, what this was picking up was just was just the, the fact that there was a uh, different frequency of males and free females in, in the cases of controls. So this was a sort of a teaching experience, my my, my first uh, ex exposure to what can go wrong caused by a technical defect. Uh, but in this case, we 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 picked it up just by filtering on the Heide, on Heide Weinberg. So this is again a very useful test to do. Here I have another um, fairly early uh, GWAS that, uh, which we did, which which gave us a very nice significant peak. This is just looking at chromosome two, and we and, and we can see we have in the center of the picture a peak with lots lots of uh, nearby SNPs which have a highly significant uh, uh, p values. Um, this was a funny one because this is uh, this is from the samples with, which were collected in France, about 250 samples, if I remember correctly. Um, but this was in the early days of using the microarrays for for GWAS, and they were expensive and it took time to to get things uh, to get things running. So in fact, we we first did the cases, and then we we planned to do the controls. Um, but when we'd already got the data for the cases, we were looking around to see if anybody had control data we could use just to quickly have a look, pre-analysis of the data to see what came out. So we we could actually, at that point, the Wellcome Trust had just started their um, their big uh, case control consortium uh, where they, and they had, they were allowing for, um, access to their control data. So we compared our 250 Northern French cases against um, uh, a similar number of uh, of controls, actually probably more controls from the UK, and we got this very striking signal on chromosome two. Um, but when we did a bit of background checking and, and looking at some of our other cohorts uh, on different diseases, we also saw the same effect. So we decided this probably wasn't related to our disease um, per se, but probably was more related to the fact that this was comparing a French samples against UK samples. And then we asked a colleague in the UK, uh, what is on chromosome two that uh, might be explained in this? And the, the answer came back straight away, well, this is lactase. So this is the gene for, um, uh, for lactase. And, well, it's the gene lactase, and, and it's the location of the mutation affecting uh, lacto lactose intolerance. And there is a gradient in, in this going north to south in, in Europe. And if you have a any differentiate differentiation in the north south locations of your of your of your cases of controls, um, in a European uh, study, this is a location where you tend to see a false result. It's simply picking up the fact that there's a different frequency allelic fre frequency of uh, this mutation in the UK than we than we find in France. And this is just to show if you home in on this, this look, this looks like a very uh, uh, a perfectly valid peak. And in fact, it is. It is. It is showing you a valid association. It's just it's not with the disease. It's just with it being French or English. Um, stratification can actually be more, can be pretty subtle. This, this um, is just showing a, a principal components analysis of uh, a set of controls, the German controls, uh, of which half of them were collected from um, northern Germany in Dresden. You know, the red crosses and half of them were from uh, southern Germany, Munich, with the uh, with the green with the green crosses. And though we don't see a complete separation, we can clearly see uh, that the green is mostly on the right and the red and uh, the red is mostly on the left. This difference is itself um, in a similar way to what we saw with the with the northern French and the, and the UK um, once I showed you earlier. This is enough to drive false associations in genes such as lactase. Um, 
if we do a, a GWAS and we happen to have our cases from northern Germany and our controls from southern Germany. So it's something to always be aware of. In fact, I, I just like excuses to put up uh, to, to put up this picture. You may have seen ones like this, but this, this is just showing you that the uh, this is a PCA of 6,000 control samples across Europe. And I've had this about over 15 years now, this, this picture. Um, and this is just, just to show you that it, there's a very, within Europe, there's a very strong correlation between genomic variability and actual physical location. Um, uh, so here we can, we, can, we can see on this graph that in the top left, um, well, I, I don't really have time to go through this in, in detail, but we have the, the Northwestern Euro Europeans up at the top. We have the Southern Europeans so, so southwest um, Europeans going coming down uh, to in the dark green we have Spain for example in the light green we have the UK uh, in light blue we have the uh, we, we have Germany and going right way over to the to the right we have the uh, Eastern European and then the European Russian so the reason I put this one up is just to show that this effect we saw with the in, within Germany also applies across the whole of Europe that if we're doing any type of association study in Europe uh, with different populations, you have to be aware that you have genes such as lactase, which have a strong um, uh, trend in the allelic frequency going north-south. You also have um, HERC2, which is the blue eyes color, which, which also has a, a similar line, a similar trend. And these will systematically, and other regions as well, will systematically give you false positive results if you don't do some type of correction for this uh, popula for, for the population structure. Okay, so cess rate, call rate. Um, as I was saying, in many high throughput technologies, uh, a data point is called as a given allele or a base or left uncalled if the data are, are ambiguous. The percentage of samples called for SNP allocation varies. Um, and most of them are, are, are normally extremely high, but you will have a small number of, of, of SNPs, for example, which behave poorly. And you can also do the same thing for a sample and say for a given, a given biological sample, how many SNPs are successfully called for that sample, and that will also vary. And this is strongly correlated with the quality of the data that's been produced. And SNPs out or samples which have low call rates are unreliable and should be removed from your data set. And this next study will, I hope, show you explain this. So this is a, 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 a large GWAS that we did again while I was in, when I was in France, which was um, uh, looking for Alzheimer's, looking for um, uh, genomic variation affecting late onset Alzheimer's. Um, not presenilin 1, presenilin 2, which are the uh, almost Mendelian forms, but this is the, uh, this is the late, later onset uh, Alzheimer's. Um, so this is, what happens if you look at a Manhattan plot? So again, we have the uh, negative log 10 p-values on the y-axis, and then the chromosomes going along on the x-axis. And this is looking at completely unfiltered data. So we, this is looking at all, in this case, 600,000 SNPs, which we were studying. Um, and the nominal p-value, which would be globally genome-wide significant, is around 10 to the minus 7. And you can see there's a lot which is above it. In fact, there's there's SNPs with p-values of 10 to the minus 300 in this data set. But that's if we don't filter at all on uh, call rate. If we start to filter on call rate, and if we say we only take SNPs which have a 90% call rate, then it tidies us up immensely. But we still have signals across the genome. We continue to 95 we can start to see we just have a couple of regions left which are which are coming out including this this one here in green on the right hand side which is actually coming out quite strongly and then um 98 then this looks much much more reasonable we we, we still have this uh signal uh this actually comes on 19 um in green uh we also have a signal at chromosome Two, which is just significant, and yes, that is lactase. Um, this is because there's a slight difference in the north-south distribution of cases of controls in this data set. And there's a few others which also are, are, are sort of borderline significant. And then if you do some 
a bit more correction for stratification. We get rid of the lactase signal. And we're left with this signal on chromosome 19, which is um, actually APO, it's one of the APO lipoproteins, not APOE, because that we already removed from this analysis, because that's a massive signal. This is APOJ, which is which is a related protein. And this got this got published and this has been replicated many times. But just to, this is just to show you the extreme effect of not filtering. If you don't filter the data, you can't see anything. Uh, but they're just, there's just so many significant results. One of the ways people um, often use to, to, to look at these types of, uh, of, of, of results and to see, to see how the, the general distribution is looking are QQ plots. Because for genomic studies, we generally would expect most of the tests, if not all of them, to be negative. Um, and the QQ plot is a way to compare graphically the observed distribution of the test statistics with what you'd expect under the null. And if you see a, a large um, deviation from the between the observation and uh, between the observed and the um, expected distribution, that's indication of a systematic bias in your test. So just to go back to our Alzheimer's uh, test again uh, study, this is a QQ plot. If we um, don't filter at all the samples, uh, the SNPs. Uh, so the straight line, which is almost horizontal here, is actually the expectation of the under the null. And the dotted line is the observation of the, the observed distribution of the, of the, of the uh, test statistic. And you can see it's very early on that you get this strong deviation between the observed and expected. This is an indication that we've got systematically biased p-values. We have far too many significant p-values. As we start filtering, we get closer and closer. So here, filtering at 95, we can see that the uh, the solid line is the expected uh, value under the null, and then these dashed lines are the 95% uh, uh, confidence intervals under the null. So we still have 95% filtering. We still have um, a lot of uh, points which are more divergent than, than the 90, the outside the 95% confidence interval. But if you get, once you get up to 98%, and if you start also doing stratification and removing extreme, extremely rare alleles, then in fact, you almost pretty much get everything that fits inside the expected um, distribution of the null. So again, that's just to show the, the, the filtering on uh, call rate is incredibly important and, and, and highly necessary. So I'm going to finish finish off with um, a study which it's this is this is this is now it's about 12 15 years old but I think it's a nice study on, on what mistakes can be made um, if you if you're not if you don't correctly do the the the, the quality control and cleaning up on your data. So this is a, a, a study which actually came out in science, but unfortunately it had to be retracted afterwards, and you can see why. Um, the study is looking at genetic signatures of exceptional longevity in humans. Um, and it's a quite large data set for, for, for at least for the time. They had um, 800 uh, centenarians um, and 4,000 population controls. And then they had another 254 centenarians, which are going to use as a replication. The discovery set was 801 centenarians and 926 population match controls. So they came from the, from the same area. Um, and the replication set, we had 250 centenarians and 340 controls. They performed their analysis for the association with, uh, with, uh, with the uh, being centenarian. And they found 70 associations. Um, and they came up with a genetic signature of exceptional longevity with a 77% prediction accuracy. And it, it, which started being a lot of alarm bells, in fact, all of this, because this is not this is not the first GWAS that have been published on longevity, and none of the others have found anything apart from APOE. Um and the epidemiologists were very uh, skeptical about this idea of a 77% prediction accuracy. But I don't want to talk about that part. I want to talk about the SNP associations for a start. So luckily in the in the paper, they, they actually give um, a lot of their detailed results. 
and we can we can see this is a a page showing their most significant uh, uh, SNPs. Um, and there's a lot here which which they're calling genome wide significant. Um, and some of them are highly significant, 10 to the minus 12, uh, which then had a, this is this top one, the Z fat. It then also has a p-value 10 to the minus 14 when in the replication set. And if you combine the replication set and the original data set, you get a 10 to the minus 24. So uh, th these seem to be very, very, very strong results. But as I said, though, they were very nicely uh, gave access in the paper to some of the, the details of, of their data set. And what became clear was that they had not filtered on call rate, their data set. Um, and it was actually slightly worse. It, the effect was worse than just than just that. Um, the problem was is, is that the, the, they had generated the data for the cases and then they hadn't cleaned this data set. The control data set, actually, it wasn't data they generated. It came from um, an, from Illumina. Illumina had maintains a set of population controls people can download and use. The problem is, is that Illumina correctly had done very careful filtering of all of their data. So the Illumina control data was filtered at 98%, and the, the case data wasn't filtered at all. And if you just uh, filter their SNPs, so that the, the the cases have at least a ninety eight percent success rate. Ah, sorry, that was just a QQ plot showing you the QQ. The QQ plot is strongly divergent from the uh, expectation, and the Manhattan plot shows you p values all all across the genome, which again is a is an alarm bell. Um, so coming back to here, sorry. If you if you look at the, the list of p values and then go and uh, significant SNPs and then go and um, um, blank out the ones which have a low call rate, you can see it's actually most of them. So here in, 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 I've just I've I've, I've uh, blanked out all the ones where the where the success rate was less than ninety eight percent, and in fact some of these the success rate was seventy percent. These were really definitely should have been removed, but we are still left with some. Um, and we still have this one at the top, the Z-fat, with uh, p-values of 10 to the minus 12 or, 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 or even lower when, they, when they're looking at the uh, replication set. So what's going on here? Is, is this, a, is this a, a true result? Well, there is one factor, and I, I like to put this one in because it just shows you why it's important to have an appreciation for all parts of, of how the data be produced. So these were this was data coming from Illumina microarrays. Um, and Illumina produced many whole genome SNP chips. And when I wrote this slide first, which was say about 14, 15 years ago, um, there was three families, and now it's probably there's probably more. Um, but there's three distinct families, and they, they, they use different chemistries, use different ways to actually uh, build the chips. So you have the first Illumina one set, which was a hundred K chip. They had Illumina 2, which was these uh, the 317 and 318K chips were probably the most widely used for uh, all the early G all the early big GWAS studies in 2005 to 2008. Um, and then you had the and also had some high density ones with 550 and 1 million uh, SNPs on them. And then at some point around just before the, the, they bought out this the, this paper, there was a, a third family called Illumina High Density. Um, which had which had these uh, these uh, these additional <coughs> additional chips on them with three hundred seventy k, six hundred ten k, and six hundred sixty k uh, SNPs. Now, on all chips, I'd say the Illumina chips are extremely good. Uh, most of the SNPs, ninety nine point nine nine percent of them, work very well, very reliable. There's a few, a small number, which work less well. Others just don't work at all. They never give any results. And some, unfortunately, give the wrong answers. Um, and it's sort of common practice that when a new a new chip comes out, you uh, uh, you do some testing, uh, and then you mark ones which are, which don't mark SNPs which don't seem to be working as expected. Put the, the, those into a into a bad list of which they can then exclude. Within the chip families, within these three families, Illumina One, Illumina, Illumina Two, and Illumina HD, uh, the common SNPs will tend to work the same way. So if a, if a, if a SNP works well in in uh, 
in one chip, it will work well in an, another chip in the same family. But if you're going across families, that's not always true. Sometimes you can have a SNP which works well in, in, in a, a particular chip in Illumina 2 and doesn't work so well in the uh, Illumina HD. And this is actually what happened in this case. Um, it was funny because the year before this paper came out, um, we at the start, I, I was working then in, in uh, near Paris at the, uh, at the CND, which is a genotyping center. Um, and we just started to, to move on to these new Illumina HD chips. And as a, as a testing test of this, we, we had some control samples where half of them have been done on the Infinium 2 chip and half of them have been done on the Infinium HD chips. And we noticed some small number, but maybe uh, 15, 20 SNPs, which gave very discordant results. And we were getting very different allele frequencies be between these two control, between the, the ones, the control pop samples, which were genotyped on Lumina 2 and those typed on Lumina HD. And I sent a query to Lumina and they came back uh, with this email um, and saying, explaining that yes, in fact, uh, unfortunately, some of the some of the the SNPs, there was an assembly, there was a problem in the fabrication, and in fact, these SNPs just did not work. They they gave an apparent monomorphic uh, result for every sample. So they said, in fact, every sample had the rare was homozygous for the rare allele for those SNPs, and that we should just remove them from the uh, from the results. And with, if you look at the the study design for 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 this study, um, you can see that they have these. Uh, you have the controls. You have the original discovery set um, with eight hundred and one centenarians, and then this replication set two hundred fifty four centenarians. As I explained before, the population controls came from Illumina, and these were all genotyped on the old Illumina two um, set of chips. The Discovery set, which was typed by the investigators here, half of it was done on the old type and half of it was done on, on the new uh, Lumina HD families. And the replication set was entirely done on the new uh, chips. And that sort of starts ringing alarm bells because if you look at uh, the list that uh, most genotyping centers have prepared showing these uh, bad SNPs, and if I apply it, to the to these list of significant SNPs, we can see that actually that gets rid of the top two SNPs on the list. Um, these are SNPs which are which basically do not work in the Illumina HD. So this explains actually how why we ended up getting more significant results with the replication set, even though it's smaller, because the replication set the cases were entirely using the, the the new chip, whereas the original discovery set was was about half half new and half old. So the difference was more striking. So we do seem to have uh, one which is highly significant, which is still remains, but this is APOE. And as I told you before, APOE was, is like the common factor which has come out of the longevity studies and uh, is likely to be true because it's a general marker of vascular health, which is obviously has a very strong factor on whether you can live to being 100 or not. So, to draw to a, to a conclusion, um, personally, I think checking quality is the most important stage of, of analysis. Um, you should be very skeptical about any interesting results uh, that you find. And until you've done everything you can think of to invalidate them, you shouldn't even consider discussing them with anybody. And the onus is, is on you, it's on the person doing the analysis to be really careful and to do every possible check um, before they actually publish or make wider, wider, more widely known the results of their analysis. A false result wastes everyone's time, including everyone's time, including yourselves. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, I think now we can have questions. So thank you, Simon, for that. I think it's so always great to remember that, you know, I always describe myself when they say, what do you do? You know, I'm a statistic, I'm a statistician working in genetics. And I always describe that as our job is to be defenders of the null hypothesis. 
because everybody else is trying to get signals to show up and we're trying to make them go away. Because if you find something yeah. in your study, you're the genius. And if you find something and it turns out to be false, I'm the idiot. <laughs> right. I mean, that's basically been my interpretation of it. So um, I'd like to open the floor for questions. And if anybody has things they'd like to say to this, I would also add that um, Simon is fluent in French. So for those of you for who there might be a language issue, please feel free to write questions in the Q&A in French or to ask him. And I'm sure he will have no trouble with that at all. So um, I guess, uh, Sonia, do you have any comments that you would like to uh, begin with? Yeah, thank you so much. It was really very inspiring. And I find that it's very courageous to to talk about the uh, mistakes and all the errors that could be done. You know, you reminded me of so many things, uh, in particular, you know, in, in relation to the first CDNA uh, libraries that we used to use. And if you remember the first sequences of uh, CDNA sequences uh, that has been given by some French scientists to UNESCO, and uh, there was this paper I don't remember if it was in Science or Nature saying that French scientists have offered uh, miscontamination to UNESCO. You know, it's sometimes uh, even uh, somehow um, very difficult to to to, uh, and the impact of errors uh, has so many <laughs> impact uh, even about the credibility of the scientists. That is why it's very difficult to report on them. And actually, I find it that it's very, very inspiring. And we need to talk about errors because it makes people um, actually gain time and money uh, because all these experiments have a lot of impact and in particular financial impact besides the impact about uh, credibility. Um, thank you. Really, I, I just want to thank you both, Joey, for referring to Simon and for, for this fantastic talk. I'm happy to see that among the participants, we have colleagues and friends from several parts of the world. Uh, there is Dr. Ahmed Ribay, who is among the first bioinformaticians in, in Tunisia. He has asked a question. Ahmed, do you want to, to, to say directly your question? Um, I think Mariam has sent you an invitation to be among the panelists. If you want to, to uh, raise your question right. directly. What do I need to do? <laughs> no, it's just uh, if you could accept the invitation from Mariam to be among the panelists. And also, I'm yes, really thank you, thank you, to see Professor Nabil and Natah, a good friend of us and of Joey from Libya, if he could also join us uh, as a panelist. I don't know if, I'm sorry, personally, I'm in a very noisy environment. Um, so let me read the question of Ahmed. If he can ah, Ahmed is here. He can do it himself. Sonny, I'm here. <laughs> Please, I'm very happy. I'm here. I, actually, I rejoined the independence. Thank you for the invitation to do so. Okay. And uh, yeah, I want to thank Simon for this uh, great presentation. And I do agree, of course, to, to most of what he has um, have said. And I do agree again with Joe that we, as ge statistical geneticists or whatever our background is, we should be something like the null hypothesis advocates. I mean, we have a lot of, of spurious correlations, spurious associations, and so on. And uh, quality control of the data is a very important point. So my comment, actually, it was just after the uh, Simon presented few few slides about the when he talked about the uh, the p-value problem. And of course, when we're doing GWAS, particularly in GWAS or even high throughput genomic studies, we are always confronted to this point. We have very small p-values. And very small is always something saying that there is something not probably not good going, go going in the good way. So one of the things that have been done, and I, I cited a paper by David Cox a few years before his death, where he addressed it in a small paragraph saying that we should also be cautious about the very small p-values. And he provided some ideas to develop about the, this issue. So my question was about the 
rather than using p-values, you, do you think that using, for example, Bayes factors, moving to Bayesian testing would be a better alternative than using like chi-square tests or regression and so on and coming with p-values that may be prone to all these problems? So do we think that this solves part of the problem of the very small p-values? I mean, I, th I think it's certainly some of, some of the, uh, the the base frameworks could could actually be be helpful in in, in this way. Um, uh, it's very difficult to say. I mean, one of the bits I, I didn't really get the time to talk about, but it's something I've I, I've recently getting started getting quite worried about is um, I, I I work a lot with with sequence data um, and. A characteristic of this is is often we use very low sample sizes. So people are working with uh, um, comparing group comparisons with maybe three sample three replicates per per group because that's the minimum that will be accepted by the statistical method. But if you actually re if you actually look at the statistical method, um, it's even though it will run with three replicates, it is not at all applicable. Um, you need about thirty replicates before the p values have any chance of being remotely correct because they're appealing to the uh, uh to the asymptotic uh, uh to the to, to the, the asymptotic distribution and i find that this is probably something which and i'm not sure the best way to deal with this apart from telling people well you shouldn't be doing these tests with this small number um because these these tests were often developed for for example the array based procedures where you cut you can have large sample sizes and they're being applied back to sequence data where it's much more expensive so um it's it's it, um and, and we're getting these inappropriate uh, uh, tests being used, and uh, there's quite you see quite a few editorials coming out saying how it's a concern in genomics for the fact that uh, non-repeatability that uh, uh, studies are not people are not repeating that, and I'm 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 sure that this is one of the major factors, is that because we're not being vigorous enough in gen in, in actually um, generating the the correct p-values, uh, reliable uh, reliable estimates of, of, the, of significance. And this is what's leading to this problem of non-repeatability because <laughs> we're just getting too much noise in there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I just had another question before leaving the floor for other people to comment on, on or ask question concerning the, the, the uh, very rare alleles. So this is one of the challenges actually in, in genome-wide association studies and even in for example, in other high throughput studies. So how, how do you think we can succeed in tackling this problem of very rare alleles just by increasing samples? Or do you think there is another way to, to deal with? Well, probably the, 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 the methods that allow us to go and uh, do a little the lumping together, but putting, putting together multiple variants within the same, you know, coding variants within the same gene, so then you're you're not relying on a, a single rare variant, but you can actually you know, gain more samples by looking at multiple ones. Maybe the way to go, because otherwise, I don't think we have enough samples. <laughs> if it's very rare, you're just not going to have enough sa samples in your population. So I think that may maybe, but that, that has its whole host of other problems as well as as, as depending on how how you do the uh, the combining. But no, no, the, this, so this, this, just this, a, <laughs> you mean moving to haplotype testing rather than making testing on alleles. Yeah. Yes. So that's the idea. Okay. Or, Thank or you. also, I think you're saying like to take different variants that look like they may have similar functional consequences. Yes. And Sorry, I'm putting those together. Putting all of those together as a class of potential is making a more hypothesis-driven question. Because if you just have one allele and you don't know what it's doing, you know, you're kind of guessing anyway, right? There's no way to really fix that statistically. You have to do the biology, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have the, the the burden tests or, or this that where you're you're looking basically for uh, am I getting too too many uh, uh, yeah rare, <clears throat> rare um, uh, nonsense mutations or, or or damaging mutations in 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 a, in a particular gene. So it's more gene based rather than allele based. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm I'm really happy to see my old friend Nabil joining us here. I would say that um, we initially started this course 
as a result of a collaboration I'd had with Nabil over the last also probably 30 years, I guess we worked together when he was a graduate student in Finland. And Simon, Nabil is the person who's in his graduate, uh, his PhD, found the lactase variant that you were <laughs> talking about. So this was Nabil's, Nabil's very good work back then. And um, so we initially started this hoping that we would be able to find a way to do outreach between Columbia University and Nabil's university in Libya trying to help because they were having a lot of problems in Libya and trying to keep people working in science over there. And Nabil is still contributing to that effort. So I'd like to welcome you, Nabil. And if you have some comments or something, it would be great to hear from you. Thank you, Joel. I would, uh, I'm very happy, really, for your invitation. And uh, thank you, uh, Simon, for the nice lecture I heard. Uh, you remind me to 1997 when I began the working with Joe in KTL in Finland. And Joe, who uh, teach me actually the first steps <coughs> in writing linkage analysis. And uh, when I saw the figure for the lactase, I was just a little bit happy because uh, after 25 years, I'm still thinking seriously, why the lactase is the highest signal in the genome? And still really, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out because I had hypothesis, it is related to the immunity, somehow to the immune system. Uh, yes, there is a lot of advantages of uh, drinking milk, but uh, the signal really, I always, uh, when I saw the uh, figure chromosome two, I know it is a lactase. <laughs> gene. And uh, we really, <laughs> after 25 years, I'm still intertwined why this is signal is so high. Yes, there is a gradient in frequency between the north and the south, between the east and the uh, west, yeah. but still the signal is really so high. Even if we put a, a part the uh, heterogeneity, it's uh, still, the signal means something still ambiguous. Uh, Joe, really, uh, we work very hard on the Lactase project and you were also uh, admired for the result we got. And really, uh, I, when I went back to Libya, many they are thinking why. Uh, I remember the questions, why you go back to Libya? I remember Lena said to me to go to Broad Institute. Uh, but I prefer to go to Libya to help here at least to establish a basement for science. We go through a lot of uh, difficulties, but at least we succeed in what uh, a base very good in biotechnology research center, which center it's established in agreement with the UNESCO in 2000. And this center, at least uh, in Libya, it is uh, it's a focus point really for many of the genetic studies. And we try hardly because the system here is not like the environment in the West. It's very difficult. I see uh, Dr. Aisha Nasif, uh, she is participating in this and she know very well, uh, she was the director of uh, uh, Institute in Zawiya Medical Research Center. And she went through a lot of uh, difficulties when she was on the head of that uh, center. So, uh, it is a very, very, very difficult uh, to work in an environment like Libya, especially with the chaos we went through. But still, there is some mm, sign, shine of science. And with the help of our friend, uh, really, Joe, I remember 
he was uh, planning to visit us in 2011 and we did even the visa and during the revolutions. And I remember in March 2011, Joe asked me, uh, I can't come. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, he didn't visit Libya and uh, I promise you will visit us soon and also Simon. Uh, really, really, I admire uh, uh, Joe for his talking because uh, I remember when you told me that uh, when you began your studies, you think uh, you try to invent something, but you told me, I still remember this very well. You find all the law of genetics is established in 1920s. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and this is really what is going on now. We don't see a lot of uh, innovation break through in mind in genetics. It seems it seems to be like a stuck hole on innovation in science and technology, uh, and this is, has uh, really some difficulty. There is a lot of data uh, producing, and we need bioinformaticians for analysis of this data. And this is which we lack, at least in some countries like Libya, we had one or two very good bioinformaticians. I know Ribai in Tunisia, we had some uh, cooperations in 2009. I still remember him, I was in Tunisia at that time. And he's really a very good uh, bioinformatician. And I said to him, <laughs> hello, hello Ribai. And, hello. Uh, hello. Joe, Joe, Joe he, uh, told me yesterday to re, uh, uh, re-establish the cooperations and I actually I had the desire to make this cooperation go through the right uh, pathway. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Simon, for uh, your presentation. Really, I admire it. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Nabil. It's, it's great to see you after all these years. <laughs> um, so um, we also have like some other people here on the panel. Does anybody have something they would like to to discuss with with Simon? I see Hada is here from Egypt and and Yosser. Um, or maybe also, they. I would like to say hello to Sunya. She wrote to me. Sunya is a very good friend of uh, mine, and uh, I really. Uh, admire her also. Dr. Uthman, <coughs> he was uh, Dr. Uthman Abdjalil, but now he is the Minister of Health in the Eastern part of uh, the country. So uh, that's what, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, Dr. Uthman and me and some others, we are um, incorporated in the political issues. So the management took us a little bit from the research but uh, sometimes you have to make some break and see the research. And hello, uh, Sunia. I'm sorry, Simon, and uh, for all the participants. Actually, um, I don't find the words because uh, for years uh, you are struggling to make things happen in your country. And um, I really admire you, Nabil. Dr. Nabil, Dr. Aisha, um, uh, Dr. Ghada, Ahmad, Dr. Ahmad, Dr. Yusuf. Everybody who is here in the panel had somehow had to face several challenges to make things happen. But you guys in Libya are facing the most challenging issues, um, as in other parts in the world who are unfortunately now living under bombs. Uh, so, and that really, it brings another perspective on our research activity. So, um, bravo, <laughs> mashallah, you're doing a great work, so please keep going. I see Rada has opened her uh, camera, and I'm really sorry for, for the participants if we are somehow um, slipping from the uh, topic about errors, but uh, these are human errors bombing others. <laughs> you know, sorry. Thank you. Yes. 
No, I just want to, to thank Simon for a very interesting talk. It's an important era we're living in with lots and lots of data. We're all producing data that we don't know how to handle. We don't know if they are right. We don't know if our interpretation of this data is the right thing or the wrong thing. We're relying on bioinformaticians and <laughs> we need a lot and lot, lot more of them. And of course, statistical genetics is a wow branch of medicine, which I am, I sorry, Joe, I have to, <laughs> to acknowledge. <laughs> I'm so bad in this branch, particularly, I did my best to try and learn, but maybe I can come to the States and get a private lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> You're always welcome. <laughs> If you're accepting the challenge, I would make it. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I so nice say, to meet you, Dr. Navid. Uh, let, us, uh, let us bring uh, all the team here in, in Tunisia. It's halfway, so you could pull, all come here. And, okay, uh, okay. So, Sonia, might, yes, that would be great. Might, I, you know, <laughs> yes. Sorry. Please. Uh, if you have a question, Rada, or there is... No, yourself. just want to thank you for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see that Yoser has her hand raised. So um, Yoser is also in, in, in the Tunisian group. Would you like to say something, Yoser? Yes. So thank you very much, Joe. And thank you, Simon, for the excellent talk. I have a question on um, the statistical relevance of imputation when you are working in, <laughs> in like some populations where you don't have a lot of reference data and um, control data. So what do you think about this? Oof. Yes, this is. We used to have a special talk on this at the, <laughs> at the on the Bulk and Trust course, which uh, I didn't have time to touch on. No, yeah. well, exactly. You, you highlighted the the issue here. I, imputation works can be can can be good if you've got a very good uh, reference control that, that matches your your control. And if so, in the European populations where they're, they're, they've now built up a lot, a lot of data, lot of data that that they're high quality data. Um, Imputation that can in 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 some areas work, work, work can be a very useful way to to work on this. But if you're working in a population where you do not have that, then it would be worse than useless. The the um you will any of the the rare 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 variants that you end up imputing are unlikely to have any be you know, the the error rate would be incredibly high just because the 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 the, the population that you're Using it as a, as a reference is so far from your actual population. Um, now, I, I I hate to say this because I, I know this is very expensive, but I mean, it, one thing that can work. I mean, the cost of sequencing is really coming down a lot for doing, and maybe not necessary to do extremely high depth sequencing to do weak sequencing of a, of, a, of a population. Uh, nowadays, with um, with the latest uh, platforms from Illumina, but also from the uh, from the uh, um, from the Chinese uh, uh, for the, for the BGI, the, the, the prices are, are dropping down. It could soon be in, in the orders of a hundred euros or less. Now that's already expensive, but I, I think selective sequencing followed by imputation for the, for the larger samples could, act, but within your population, could actually be of a, a, a very appealing strategy. Trying to trying to adapt. Um, uh, a reference population which is distinct from from from, from the North African, I, I think, would be would be yeah very bad. <laughs> uh, exactly. That's why I I just wanted to um I mean comment on that because Sonia was talking about the challenges that we are facing and we are really advocating a lot on the importance of delivering reference sequences for our populations yeah. and not just to know about our genetic architecture but also for statistical analysis like for the amputation and so on. So this is one of uh, uh, the, the the goals or or the aims that we uh, are working on. And we are still struggling to convince um, the government to fund these uh, human genome projects, but I think that it will be done soon. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. And and one thing to remember is, of course, if you find something with imputation and you think it's important, genotype. Yeah. Check to make sure it's real. And that's, I mean, and if you, I often read papers where they say, well, our sample's big and it's so significant, we don't have to actually check it. And I'm like, well, the, 
but you're telling other people it's important and that they should be using this in their research and yet it's not important enough to spend the money to check it then i think it's probably not real <laughs> and you don't even believe it <laughs> yes thank you i, I remember when we when when we were in, in, in paris doing um because when i was working on on gwas say this is more than like 15 years ago but then even though we were using microarrays, we weren't using the imputation, we were using our actual genotypes, we still would always genotype, re-genotype with, uh, with another method using TACMAN or, some, or something like that before it'd be published. But you wouldn't just assume that the results were correct from the, from the genotyping. And that holds much more if it's in, imputed. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Even imputed from the right population. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it, exactly. <laughs> yes. Because it's not That's magic. It's not like... It, otherwise, it's just magic, you know. <laughs> um, Ahmed, you had a question. Yeah, it it was just a comment. Actually, it's it's the the same sense in using amputation for the uh, for the particularly for population for which we have very few data. Like this is the the challenge currently for African population. You know, that if you look at the the rate of studies, you have not something like one or two percent of genome whites association studies or even sequencing on African population compared to European or uh, or Asian population. So this is a real challenge and the challenge is actually producing a lot, lot of data. So this is one of the big issues that you are facing. You also talked about the, the, the project we currently have in Tunisia, but other projects are going on in, in different countries in Africa. And if you look at whole genome sequences, for example, you have no more than 10,000 genome sequences in Africa compared to millions for, for European descent population. So this is the biggest challenge, I think, for the, the, the new era of uh, research or genome-wide right. research. I mean, yes, I mean, also there's a big difference. 10,000 10, um, sequences in a very relatively very homogenous population like uh like like the uk is very different to even if you could do ten thousand sequences in just tunisia which i imagine is probably going to be quite a bit more diverse and if you look at all of north africa then you need much more than that ten thousand to get an equivalent uh representation of the of the population it's yeah this is <laughs> this is a, is a problem plus you have the issues with the consanguinity and everything like that, where almost within families, the imputation might be very different because you have, you know, such population structure that you don't have to deal with, you know, in, in other places. Well, one thing I know what Joe likes some, um, in previous years, where I've heard Joe's talks, he likes to make the comment of uh, an advantage of, of when you're not one of the, uh, the, the Western countries who are always using the latest technology is being a bit behind you can actually pick some of the new stuff coming out where because you've not invested all your money in the old stuff so there's there's some also interesting work which um i'm, I'm very interested in because i'm interested in the technical parts as well so take this with a pinch of salt but for, um now for example using the uh, long read sequences um and we were working on a project um where we can do very low coverage but long, but with ont with the um, uh, nanopore sequencing uh, but in a population and i'm hoping with this i can actually build up at least haplotypes um a very good representation of the haplotypes in the population which be the haplotype structure would be much more accurate than doing this with alumina because you are you're you're getting reads of uh of 10 of median is around 10 kb as opposed to 150 base pairs and that might be in, important when we're trying to compare populations which are quite uh we expect to be quite diverse compared to the uh European ones where we might have the structural variation, which is very hard to disentangle from alumina and should be much easier with the longer resequencing. So I'm just saying that maybe if you can, it's going to take you some years to get everything together, get the political will to do this. But I think the, the technologies will be better. And <laughs> also long, long read is probably more important when you are likely to have structured population with lots of consanguinish consanguinities where you'd have very long haplotypes existing that would be very different between families. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I think it's uh, it could be very interesting. Oh, Sonia? I wanted to share with you, for instance, uh, an example in which the, the mistake has uh, a medical impact. 
actually we were talking about uh, Mendelian simple diseases, which are not as simple as that. And um, several years ago, there was this family with uh, primary hyperoxaluria, which is a renal uh, disease, very severe renal disease, and it leads to renal failure. And actually, um, the patient uh, was tested, he, uh, he, he was homozygous for a founder mutation, and the medical doctors assumed that his parents were heterozygous, and they have not checked the status of the parents because they were both apparently normal. And uh, his mother, uh, she, she, she gave her um, uh, kidney to her son for uh, uh, renal replacement. And it turns out that she was homozygous, but she was asymptomatic. And uh, actually, because they assumed that uh, asymptomatic parents were for sure heterozygous, and actually, uh, and now this doesn't happen anymore because for for um, uh, donors uh, they have to be they have to be checked. And uh, we had some surprises in in families uh, in which they based on um, classical Mendelian inheritance and on clinical presentations they were assumed to be either heterozygous or homozygous and because of the lack of means, I mean, people, they don't make necessarily all the tests. And actually, what I would like to, to investigate in, in the future, because these conferences are also the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, collaborations, it's about the penetrance of diseases, uh, in particular in consanguineous families. And uh, we usually talk about penetrance for uh, autosomal dominant diseases and not for autosomal recessive. And I don't know why, for several reasons, um, we had several speakers who talk about uh, dominant diseases, and they say that they, they don't see these types of diseases in uh, uh, consanguineous or endogenous populations. And actually, it's not because they don't see them, because they have different clinical presentations, because of all the selections that could have been made uh, uh, during the several uh, uh, centuries and uh, thousands of years uh, of having this particular population structure. I don't want to talk more because I see that we, we are just two minutes. Uh, <laughs> but I really, I want to thank you so much, um, uh, Joe, for, for referring to Simon. Simon, for the great talk and uh, all the panelists and participants. Really, it was very enriching. And um, I hope that we will continue having this type of uh, critical thinking discussions. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are other questions. Otherwise, I would like to invite you for a cup of tea in Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> Mint tea. Uh, mm. and, uh, Very nice. But, uh, <laughs> we'll have to wait for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, yes, thank everyone for for being here uh, it's really thank you simon for taking the time to do this and um you know hopefully we can build on this and build some you know some ways we can work together going forward and nabil it's just great to see you after probably 20 years and um i'm i'm glad that we finally gotten you involved in these things and we hope you'll be able to come back for the future uh in episodes of this and, and, and get more interaction between all of you. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank, you. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>